Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Everybody got some rest tonight. Um, so everybody's tired and exhausted. Uh, but hey, it is what it is. We're, we're getting there. We're almost done. Uh, so we're pushing forward every day. So we're going to go ahead and get through this and keep pushing. So tonight we're actually going to talk about how we create and also terminate an agency. So how we actually are going to create it, and then also how we terminate. So, Mr. Grossman, can you, uh, there you think, sir. So tonight, our outline basically is how and when does the agency, is it going to be created? We're also going to talk about the important issues uh, that are involved. We'll jump in and also talk about how agency is going to be uh, terminated. And then we'll talk about the duties of the agency uh, that survive termination. And so we're going to go into each one of these and discuss them in, in detail. So that you have a better understanding of each and every one of these different types of situations. Okay. So the very first thing, common sense wise, is how and when is an agency created? So Cody, if you're going to represent Ms. Davenport, how do you actually represent Ms. Davenport? Well, what's it say right here, Cody? Mutual agreement. What's that mean? Uh, consent of other people to agree. So you're telling me that Ms. Davenport has to be okay with you representing her and you got to be okay with representing her? Is that how this works? Correct. Man. So we actually have to work together? Correct. So the key thing here is yes is that you have to have consent. It has to be an agreement. Ms. Davenport has to be okay with Cody representing her, and Cody has to be okay with, with representing her as a client. Okay. The next one is that it does require what's called consent and control. Now, here's the difference now, Cody. You're the professional. Ms. Davenport is hiring you to represent her. So who controls who? I work for on behalf of her or like for her, so like basically Is she your boss? In a way, yes. Yes. Your client is always your boss. So let me ask you this. What if Mr. Eugene comes in, Miss Davenport told you I want to list my house for two hundred thousand, and Mr. Eugene comes in and gives you an offer for a hundred thousand dollars for her house. And Miss Davenport, you give Miss Davenport the paperwork, and she says, I want to accept this offer. Would you advise her to do that? She says she won't or would? She would. She wants to accept the hundred thousand. She wants to lose a hundred thousand dollars. Would you advise her to do that? Uh, if I, I mean, Be honest, would you really tell her to take a hundred thousand dollars less? I mean, I, I would say no. No. You tell her no. You lost your mind. Yeah. <laughs> right? Miss Davenport, what are, what are you drinking over there? What, what's in what's in that uh what's in that deal there you're drinking? You know? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what you'd be asking her, right? Is why would you accept a hundred thousand dollars less on a on a house of two hundred grand? But Mr. Eugene, can Miss Davenport still bypass Cody's recommendation and accept your offer. Oh, yes, she did. She's the one selling. But, but, but wait a minute. But Cody's the professional, and he says no. No matter. She's still the boss. But Cody's the professional. She's still the boss. She's the one who makes the decision. She gives the final okay. This sounds like how my office works. I, I thought I was the boss, but it's the, the office manager. That's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, but the whole thing comes to it is yes. The control comes down to what? The client. Just like if Mr. Eugene, if I tell, or say Stefan here, and Stefan, you've dealt with this before. Mr. Eugene tells you, Stefan, I see Miss Miss Davenport's listing. I want to go off for a hundred thousand. I want you to draft a contract for a hundred thousand. Do you have to draft an offer for a hundred thousand? Why are you saying yeah? But it's a waste of your time. 
You mean you still got to do what Mr. Eugene tells you? Man. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I spend a minute there just to be facetious, okay? Because the fact of the matter is, is that agents, as real estate agents, Cody, you know, and Stephanie, you know, sometimes you want to take your head and do what when your client won't listen? Ram it into the wall, right? Because they won't listen, okay? And you try to sit there and you say, you tell Mr. Eugene in real life if he was your client, are you stupid? No, one thousand. That's you. Yeah, and isn't that what you want to say sometimes? Right. Yeah, because of the fact of the matter is, is what you're making him draft a contract that, you know, that we know clear as day. When I submit that to Cody, Cody's gonna be like, "What's your client drinking?" Right, Cody? Yeah. yeah. So in that situation, is is you have to remember, no matter what, your duty is to who. Right. Your duties to your client, period. Okay? And you are controlled by your client. Now, can at any point in time, could Cody or Stephen, could y'all let your clients go? If Mr. Eugene is consistently putting stupid offers in, could you eventually just say, you're wasting my time, I'm done with you? Can you do that? Yes. Can you do that? Oh, I can. I can broker away. The broker has to do it. Not the agent, the broker. So what the right response is, is Mr. Grossman meets with me, tells me Mr. Eugene has been submitting 10 offers that are half the price, wasting my time, and he wants to let Mr. Eugene go. At that point, I might text or email Mr. Eugene and say, or call him and say, Mr. Eugene, you know, we want to try to, to explain to you that when Cody, even though he's with a different brokerage, when he lists the property, he's done a comparative market analysis. So he knows that Miss Davenport's house is worth $200,000. Now understand you want to get the best deal. Completely get that, sir. However, every time you send one of my people and have them drafting something up, we're losing money. So I've got to make money just like you got to make money. So my question, sir, is, is that are you serious about proceeding and if you are can we start putting in more justifiable offers oh we got a hundred thousand that's all i got well then we need to change our criteria and do what mr grossman find you properties in that level because Stephen, do you get people that sometimes do that that they're approved for 200 but looking at 400 yeah yeah they do Okay. So again, you do have to have that mutual agreement. Now, Trailer states that a broker who represents a party in a real estate transaction acts as that party's agent. This is that part that we were talking about. Just because you're called a real estate agent, you're not actually the agent. You're an agent or a branch of your broker. Okay. So you're an arm of your or an extension of your broker but the broker is the one that is representing the party okay now while acting as an agent for another the broker or salesperson acting for the broker is what we call a fiduciary let's rephrase that while acting as an agent for another the broker or the salesperson now we're talking about you okay acting for the broker is a fiduciary relationship which means that you're held at the highest standard there is so like we talked before cody can i go over and represent you as a real estate broker but put my interest in front of yours what i have a fiduciary duty so i have to put my interest behind yours, not in front, behind you. Now let me ask you this, Cody. So we both see Miss Davenport's property, and we know it's going to increase in value. We both want to buy it, and I'm representing you. Can I have you submit an offer and I submit an offer? Well, what's the problem there? For me to draft up an offer, what's the problem? You're going to have to tell me what? How much you're approved for? 
So if you tell me you're approved for $250,000, all I have to do is what? Write your contract up for $250,000, and then what am I going to do? You ever see the prices right? There you go. I'm going to do $250,000 $250, and $1. Because then I'm going to outbeat you. Okay? So in that situation is, you cannot ever put your client's interest in front of yours. Or in front of the, uh, your interest in front of theirs. So what are some non-essential elements of agents? Well, these are some things that you need to be aware of. Some non-essential elements is a license, compensation, in writing, and a contract. Okay. Number one, if you're going to represent somebody, we got to make certain that that person has the legal rights to do that. Okay. How many of you want to hire an attorney that hasn't passed the bar? No, you wouldn't. Okay. You want somebody that's knowledgeable. Also, compensation. We need some form of compensation. Well, it's not always required. We need some form of compensation. It also needs to be in writing. And there needs to be some form of a contract. Okay. So the Texas rules state that written agreement must be required to sue. So watch this. Miss Linda, this is something that you might want to take note on when you talk to the agent. So we'll put it this way. Miss Davenport, she's a new agent, just got a real estate license. And she has a very good friend, Miss Leela. Okay. And so Miss Davenport calls Miss Leela Tells Miss Leela, I got a brand new real estate license. I'm a brand new girl. I'm ready to go out and sell your house for you. So Miss Leela says, Okay, girl, sell my house for me. So she goes and puts her sign in the yard and she puts it on the MLS and she does all this wonderful stuff and she brings a buyer and the buyer pays exactly what Miss Leela wants. But when it gets to closing, Miss Leela says, yeah, we got in a fight, Miss Davenport. I'm not paying you nothing, and walked away. After Miss Davenport's done all that work, okay? Miss Linda, can Miss Davenport sue Leela? This is a loaded question. Can Miss Davenport sue Leela? I'm going to say yes. Can I ask why? What is your if reasoning? If she has all the correct documents. Oh, no. What did I say? Did I ever say anything about documents? No. So not me. No. Number one, no, there's no documents. I just said that they just basically ended up. Conversation. There's conversation. She just went and put sign up and all this. And there, that's it. It's just words. The first thing is, is it in writing? No. Since it's not in writing, what happens? It's not enforceable. It's, it's Leela's words against who? It's Davenport's. Okay. Second thing is in this situation is can a real estate agent, I said she's a new agent, can a real estate agent sue for commission? No, only the broker. So even if it was in writing, Miss Davenport still has to come to me to get permission to sue. Okay. So in that situation is, it must be in writing. Now let's flip the, flip the script here now. Mr. Eugene, you got your real estate license and you met Mr. Keith one day. Y'all were, y'all happened to be at a restaurant. Y'all were eating. Mr. Keith was talking about he's wanting to buy a house. And, uh, and so you start talking to him and you give him your card and Mr. Keith goes over and you start showing him properties. And he ends up, you show him 60 properties, and Mr. Keith decides to, to get one. So you get the IEBS form signed by Mr. Keith, and he helps you fill out the application and everything. And then after Mr. Keith gets in, uh, he's all situated in, the real estate broker, Mr. Cody, that you brought Keith to, refuses to pay you. 
Can you sue Keith? But can you sue Keith for a ransom? Oh, Keith's on here. What you got, Keith? What I was going to say no. He you can't sue me. No. He says no, and he's right. Well, wait a minute. Did I ever say anything about Mr. Eugene getting a buyer's representation agreement signed? What form did I say, Ms. Linda? I said the IABS form. Never said anything about the buyer representation. So Mr. Key is technically, you can't go after him. The only thing that can happen is who? If the listing Cody put was in the MLS, then your broker can go after Cody, but nobody can go after Keith because there's not a buyer representation for him. So do you see the importance of both a listing contract and a buyer rep contract. Do you see why it's imperative that the agents always, as you as an agent, always want to get something in writing? Because see what happens, Mr. Eugene, in that situation, had you ended up had Keith sign a buyer rep and Cody refuses to pay, then what happens? Now we can go after Keith and say we're entitled our 3% worth of money. You see what I'm saying? Miss Linda, you've been in this long enough. How often do clients, how often are they willingly, willingly open to signing a buyer rep? Very far few in between. Very far few in between. Because here's the thing. When they get to see in that buyer, that commission payment, and they see that they have to be paid, what happens? Money. They don't want to sign it. Because they know that I can just come over here to Mr. Grossman, and he'll just show me properties all day long, and I don't have to pay him nothing. He won't, he won't make me sign no buyer rep. I'll use Mr. Grossman. Because Mr. Grossman, he, he don't care if he gets paid. Now, what happens after a while, Mr. Gross, but after you do that for a while, eventually you start doing what, too? Start putting a buyer rep, too, right? But also, here's the difference as well. I'm going to go to Mr. Grossman and use him, but that means he's probably only been in real estate how long if he's not using a buyer rep? Very new. Very new. Very short period. Okay. It, it only takes one time. For you to go show about 70 houses to get no money, but you'll know you'll always get a buyer rent. Okay? One time. Okay, it's all it takes. So again, there has to be a written agreement. There also has to be written permission to do certain things. There has to be certain things lined out of those elements that have to be done. The written agency contract. It's the duties of the agent and principal, okay? The contract itself states what exactly, Cody, you're gonna to do to list Ms. Davenport's property and what Ms. Davenport's gonna do in order to facilitate and help you in listing your property. Mr. Eugene, in your situation, you're going to end up, you're going to give Mr. Keith a buyer representation form and you're gonna tell Keith this is what I'm going to do to help you find a property. And Keith is going to tell you, this is what I'm going to do to facilitate and help you in locating a property. Okay. So it sets out the duties of the agent and the principal. It also sets out the most important element. Number two, Cody and uh, Mr. Eugene, do you want to get paid? You want to make money? I don't want to work for free. No. So in that situation is, it stipulates the expectations of compensation, okay? Ms. Davenport, do you think this is a wise decision? Ms. Leela comes up to you and she says, hey girl, glad you got your license, congratulations, I, I want you to sell my house, 
but I'm not going to sign any forms. You know, I got you, girl. I got you. Is that is that okay? Does that hold up in court? No. No. <laughs> That's right. It's it's worthless. See, because friends do that, right, Cody? Hey, man, you get this lunch. I'll get the next one. All right, just I'll get the next time. Would that next time ever happen? Nope. nope. Okay. You need to stipulate compensation. And like I tell my agents personally, if they won't listen, then what do you do? Blame it on the who? The broker. Because if Miss Davenport tells Miss Leela, girl, I'd be more than glad to go over here and, and represent you and all. And if it was my business, I would do it. But my broker requires that it has to be in writing. Now what happens? What does that look like to Miss Leela Miss Nobles? Well, but it sounds like this. What? Is she the bad girl? Is, is Miss Leela the bad friend? I mean, Miss Davenport the bad friend? Yeah, that's what she's like. saying. Like, she doesn't want you to have to sign this, but it's a requirement. Yeah, it's my boss. my boss. Yeah, my my broker is going to chew me out if I don't get this signed. It's kind of funny, like, you'll get in trouble without That's trouble. right. It's kind of like Miss Linda a lot of times. I always tell her, if they don't like what, what you're doing, your broker, your boss has told you. That's what it is. They want to get mad, they come talk to me. Because then what I'm going to tell you is this. I'm following Trex rules. So if you really want to get mad at the person, call the state. That's who you need to complain to. Not to me, not to Linda, not to Miss Davenport, but to the state. Because if the state makes rules, I got to do them. Okay? So again, you got to have the compensation, the expectations. And there also has to be sufficient detail to protect both. So you can't use very broad terms. You can't say, Cody, you will uh, represent Mr. Eugene um, indefinitely. What's the problem with that? There's no start and date. There's no start, there's no end date. And Mr. Eugene, do you want to forever use Cody? No, it's not that you don't like him. It's the fact of the matter is, what happens if you move up to Dallas and he moves to Galveston? Is he really going to be competent enough to sell in Dallas? No. Okay. So in that situation is there needs to be enough detail of what's going to be there. It also can't be something like this. Cody says he's going to be a real estate agent. You're going to be selling property. Okay. Well, what is, what's Cody going to do? What's Cody's duties? Is Cody going to put a sign up? Is he going to put it on the MLS? Is he going to put it online? Is he going to go over there and put lock boxes on it? What, what is Cody going to do? You have to have the details. In regards to agency classifications, there's different types. We've talked about these top two many, many, many times. We can probably beat that in your head. You'll probably know that for the rest of your life. But Expressed is what? It's told, said, wrote out. This is it. Okay. Implied is what, Mr. Eugene? No, not always right. It's your actions. Actions. Okay. It's just like I tell people to think this. Expressed, I'm telling you, you're writing it out. Implied, it's like if I walk in this classroom and I just come up here to the front of the classroom and I just start talking. You're going to imply what? I'm the teacher. Right? Just like if Miss Linda comes in and there's a client sitting in the lobby and she walks into the broker's office and sits down in the broker's seat, what are they going to imply? She's the broker. She's the broker. And I don't want to be no broker. <laughs> okay? So in that situation <laughs> is no. you have to end no. up your actions <laughs> no. are the ones that end up basically providing you that information. You also have different types. These bottom three down here are different ways that they can occur. What happens is there's different types of agencies, and I'll let y'all kind of read through these on your textbook, but basically what this is talking about is this. Sometimes Mr. Eugene, well, I'm picking on Mr. Eugene a lot, Miss Linda. Miss Linda goes over 
and she wants to sell her house and she calls Garrett and she tells Mr. Garrett, she says, Mr. Garrett, I want you to sell my house for me. And Garrett says, yes, ma'am, I would be more than happy to sell you, sell your house. So Mr. Garrett goes over and again, no paperwork. So it's not expressed. It's all verbal. So Garrett goes out, he starts putting the property up and trying to sell it for her, get her a buyer. And after he procures everything and gets a buyer, guess what he ends up doing? Miss Linda got everything ready and now says, okay, Garrett, I don't want you anymore. Get out of here. Thank you for your help, but uh, going out of here, I don't, I don't need your help no more. What's the problem there, Cody? Should Miss Linda be enriched by her using him? Should, should Miss Linda be benefited because of Garrett's work? No. Because the fact of the matter is, is Garrett put work in for it. Yeah, he put effort into it. So there can be in some situations that a agency relationship can be ratified. Where it comes back and says, Miss Linda, you still owe Garrett, even though you terminated him. He did all the work. You still owe him money. And remember, Garrett, I didn't say that. Justin said it. <laughs> Garrett, Garrett's sleeping right now. Garrett, wake up. Garrett, Garrett's sleeping right now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we got Good you, job, Garrett. Garrett. All right. But the key thing is that this situation is, is that when you're going through these, you have to be aware that your clients will sometimes try to pull stuff like that. But understand also agents even try to pull that stuff. For example, what happens if Mr. Uh, let's see here, Mr. Enrique decides that Ms. Davenport's property is in a prime location. And so Mr. Mr. Enrique goes to Miss Davenport's property and she goes and she, I mean, he puts a, a sign in her yard without her knowing. And he does it so that he can try to drum up leads. Okay. Well, if Miss Davenport lives in Fort Worth and he lives in Houston and if Miss Davenport's property is in Houston and, and Enrique puts a sign up, how often are you going to see that, that sign, Miss uh, Davenport? You live in Fort Worth. Not much. Not much. Maybe once every other year or once a year or whatever, right? So he goes out, he puts a sign up, he gets calls off of it, he gets leads, and then what ends up happening in the situation is Miss Davenport finds out that he got a buyer because Mr. Cody, you called Enrique and said, Hey, I want to buy it in cash. So then Enrique calls. Miss Davenport says, hey, I got a buyer for your property. And by the way, I, I, through my actions, have an agency with you. So you owe me money. Well, courts also are going in that situation saying, no, not really, Enrique. You uh, basically broke the law by putting a sign on her property. So if Miss Davenport accepts that offer and goes ahead and sells it to Cody, you're not owed nothing because you broke the law in the first place, okay? So in that situation is, is that there are different types of classification in regards to agencies. And people will always try to argue a million different ways, guys and gals, always will try to argue a million different ways. But the whole thing comes back to unjust enrichment. Meaning that if Ms. Davenport is the injured party, she should not be required to pay Enrique for him doing something illegal, okay? And then flips on the other side. If Miss Linda kicks Cody out and Cody did all this work, well, Cody, you're still entitled to a commission because Miss Linda's being crooked, okay? So very key in these different situations. So again, we're gonna go through these real quick to explain them, but basically agency or express agency is it's very clear, it's defined, it's explicit, and it's unmistaken. Meaning that you know for a fact, if I give a contract, Mr. Eugene, to you, it states everything, okay? The agent will then acquire 
direct authority. They get direct authority. Now, it can be oral or written, but in real estate, what does it need to be? Written. Okay. And examples of these would be a listing contract or a buyer rep contract because they're written out. Okay. And again, like we talked about, you have your expressed and your implied authority. This is another one. Mr. Eugene, Mr. Grossman comes to you and you have a couple of properties and they happen to be right next door to each other. Okay. You sign a listing contract with Mr. Grossman to sell 123 Main Street, but you own not only 123 Main Street, but you own 456 Main Street, 789 Main Street, and so forth and so on. Okay. But you have a listing contract with Mr. Grossman for 123 Main Street. Okay. Mr. Grossman goes out and he ends up, Mr. Grossman walks over and he goes and he starts telling other people, Mr. Nobles, that he can sell any of these properties. <laughs> okay. But you only signed with Mr. Grossman, what, Mr. Eugene? 123 Main Street. Mr. Grossman may be trying to create an implied authority so he can get all the listings. Okay? So it's whose duty to put a stop to that? Yours. Because if Mr. Grossman is trying to go show these other properties, you may be required to pay him a commission for those that sell. Okay? So you got to be very careful with these. An implied agency is no expressed agreement. We don't have an expressed agreement. They're created through your actions or your words. This is that part where Mr. Grossman, you have an expressed agency with Mr. Grossman for 123 Main, but now here he is over here showing Miss Linda and Miss Davenport these other properties you got because they're being built, but you don't have a contract with him on those. Because his actions of him going and showing it, guess what? You have a potential implied agency. So he would have an express one, two, three main, but have an implied agency for four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. Okay. Now again, to avoid, they need to have disclosures. So if you don't want Stefan doing something like that. What you would do is this, Mr. Eugene, you would go over and you would put in your contract that four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is not his listing. And then if he tries to do this implied, guess what happens? Well, it's said expressively in your contract that you're not to do those and you're not entitled. So you just wasted your own time, Mr. Chris. Okay. So remember agency is a transaction specific contract. So if you have multiple properties, that means you have to have what? Multiple agreements. Okay. So disclosures must be made in each separate transaction. Trailer 1101.652 B7 states that it is grounds for track disciplinary action if a licensee, here you go, fails to make clear to all parties to a real estate transaction the party for whom the license holder is acting. That's not fun. You do not in any shape or form at all, do you go out and try to represent both parties or conceal that you're not representing those parties. Miss Linda, she's a real estate agent. She goes out and she starts, she gets Miss Davenport to sign a contract, and then she wants to get the whole 6%. So Cody walks in, and then she's like, hey, Cody, how you doing? Don't you like this beautiful house? Isn't it really nice? You want to put an offer in, right? Cody, did Linda ever tell you who she represents? What did she do? What was she trying to do? She's trying to conceal it and get you to do what? Buy it. So that she gets what? The whole 6%. Linda, is that a smart move? No. no, it creates a huge liability. Okay. This is called a stimulus uh, agency. 
It's also called an agency by estoppel. Okay. And so the key word is for all appearances. So think of this contract or this agency as I'm a little fly on the wall over here in the corner and I'm observing. I can't hear what you're saying. I'm just observing. So if I see Miss Davenport walking around with Miss Leela at different properties, I'm going to assume what? Miss Davenport is what to Leela? Her real estate agent. Even though Miss Davenport does not have any type of duty to Leela. Okay. Now, in this situation, the court will prevent the denial of agencies. And what this means is, is if Miss Davenport showing Leela a lot of properties and Miss Leela refuses to sign a buyer rep, if Miss Davenport actually finds a property, guess what? There could be an agency by estoppel, meaning that after Miss Davenport does all the work and gets Leela into a property, Miss Davenport, you're still owed a commission. Because of the fact of the matter is, for all appearances, you're acting as her agent. You're acting as her agent. Okay. Wilson, Wilson B. Dunsey stated that the buyer thought Wilson was an agent of Dunsey. They made the decision on that presumption. Thus, Wilson, Wilson is now the agent of the seller. So what they're saying is, is if a third party assumes that you're their agent, you're their agent. Okay. So I got to be very careful. Okay. This is that one we were talking about the agency by ratification. There are four elements for there to be what's called an agent after the fact. The first one is, is that the agent performs what's called unauthorized acts. Okay. So in this situation, this kind of comes back to that situation where we were talking about, was it Cody that put up the sign? Or no, it's Enrique. Enrique puts up the sign in Miss Davenport's land in Houston. Now my question first, Miss Linda, did, did Enrique have authorization to put a sign in Miss Davenport's property when she's in Fort Worth? No, there was no communication after the call. Nope. So it's considered unauthorized, right? Did the client subsequently learn of the acts? Yeah, Enrique called her and said, I have a buyer. Yes. Client does not deny the agent's authority to act. Okay. So in that particular situation, if the a or the client does not deny that agent's authority, and the client actually is going to benefit from the actions, then in this situation, he is considered an agent after the fact. But if you notice, Miss Davenport has to agree to all these. But we said earlier that Miss Davenport did not agree. She actually did deny the agent's authority. So since she did, could Enrique come back and enforce agency by ratification? No, because not all the elements are present. Okay. Gratuitous agency is where there's a payment of fee does not determine agency. But you got to be careful when giving your opinion. So here's the key thing. Mr. Eugene, you walk in, step in to Broker Grossman's office. And Broker Grossman, you, you walk in, you talk to him, you give him $1,000. And you just want him to end up reviewing a document, maybe maybe him going through and looking over a contract that you uh, you filled out a TREC form and, and you just want brokers, Grossman, to, to tell you if it's a, a good or a bad form, okay? If he's just stipulating standard facts, he's not doing anything wrong and there is no gratuitous agency. But if Mr. Grossman says, well, you know, Mr. Eugene, looking at this, I see that they're doing an earnest money for only $100. You know, I would, if it was in my deal, I would put $2,000 here. 
options. If it was mine, I would do this and I would do that. What's he giving? What are you doing, giving him, Mr. Grossman? You're what? You're giving his opinion. You're telling Mr. Eugene your thoughts. And if you do that, what happens? Mr. Eugene could say what? Well, he's representing me. He's giving me advice, so he's representing me. So you have to be very careful when you give your opinion. Okay? Document agency. The key thing is that courts always follow the money. Okay? They always are going to follow the money. In this court case, the broker tried to claim he was not responsible since the associate only was doing a favor for a friend. The court held that the licensee performed negligently and therefore responsible even if no fee was collected. See, that's what happens. People, Stephen may come in one day and tell me, hey, Justin, I got a friend that's wanting to, you know, he wants to do something and uh, he wants to buy a property. And, you know, I, it's just a friend of mine. It's only a $100,000 property. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to charge him nothing. I'm not going to charge him anything. It's my friend. It's 100000 I'm not going to charge him. What happens normally when they're friends, Miss Linda? How, how do those transactions go? They do what most of the time they follow through, cause problems between the friendship, and also could be family members that are hurt from it too. Do, do those ever? Do they ever go exactly as planned? No, those are basically the ones that are going to be the hardest ones to deal with. Biggest headaches you're ever going to have, yeah. right, Mr. Grossman? What's you know who right now? He's who's uh, friend. Yeah. Uh huh. They're horrible. Every time I do a transaction for a friend or family, it goes south. Every time. Not just every time. I'll follow everything by the book, and it still goes south. Every time. And yet to get one to go smoothly. Okay? you got to be careful because guess what? This broker had to still pay a fee. So his, his agent did a favor, and the broker got screwed. Okay. So what are some important issues? Well, when dealing with agencies, you got to look at the legal effects. Remember, the agent stands in the client's shoes. So if Enrique goes out and he's representing, say, Mr. Colton, and Enrique finds a property that he's like, Dad blasted, this is a dang good deal. I'm going to buy this property myself. But Mr. Colton already told him the exact property he's looking at, that's what Colton's wanting. Guess what? Colton gets first dibs. Colton gets first dibs. Not Enrique, Colton. So you have to understand in the eyes of the court, they're going to look at where the agent stands. Also, what is the liability? Well, it's going to be based upon the agency status. What type of status do we have? What is that status? Is in a situation, is uh, Enrique, what is number one, what's his level of licensing? Is he a broker or is he a salesperson? And what type of agency is it? Is it expressed or not expressed? Okay. Remember, the principal is liable for the agent's actions. Let me explain this in detail real, real quick. So Enrique is representing Colton in a transaction. Enrique goes out and he works for me. He's my real estate agent. Okay. So Enrique goes out. He goes and uh, he lists, or well, he helps Colton buy a property. And because of Enrique's negligence, meaning that Enrique just kind of gives half the effort, 
Colton ends up basically getting sued by Mr. Eugene. Because Enrique didn't follow certain deadlines and all of this. So Colton gets sued. Now, Miss Linda, is if Colton, Enrique's his real estate agent, and I'm Enrique's boss, and Colton gets sued, is Colton just gonna be like, you know what, man, no big deal. I got sued, I lost a ton of money, but no big deal, Enrique. We're best friends. Is that how this works? What's Colton gonna do? He's not gonna go after Enrique. Who's he gonna go after? Me. He's gonna come after me. So Enrique or Colton is gonna come after me, saying that I did not supervise Enrique properly, and therefore I need to pay the damages. So now I go pay those damages. Now, Miss Linda, am I? After I get sued, am I going to be like, oh, man, Enrique, you're still my best agent. We're best buddies. More likely you're going to terminate into You should. Uh, I should. <laughs> In reality, what's going to happen? The broker's going to do what? The broker's going to turn around and sue him for violation of what? Of his contractual duties and his contract review. So ultimately, if you see... Colton's not going to sue Enrique directly. He's going to ensue or sue Enrique indirectly, meaning that he's going to come to me and then I'm going to pass it down to Enrique. Do you saw, see why in that situation is? It is imperative by all means that you make certain that you understand as a real estate agent, you have to follow certain rules and certain protocols because Miss Linda, in our firm, in every firm, do we have rules and regulations, policies and procedures? Yes. Now, do agents always follow those to a T? No. No, they don't, do they? No. And every time an agent does not follow it to the T, what happens? Problems occur. Problems occur, but also their liability does what? Jumps up. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact of the matter is, is what? Enrique, in this hypothetical, he did not follow the protocols. He was doing his own little thing and just kind of giving a half effort job. And because of that, he got his prime suit. And so Colton, of course, has to sue me because he can't sue Enrique. So he has to sue me, which then in return, I'm going to sue Enrique. Okay. So you got to understand how this works. Also, constructive and input notice. There was a court case that basically stated that notification to a subagent constitutes constructive notice to the subagent's client, which is the seller. And what this basically states is this, Mr. Eugene, okay, if I am your agent and Mr. Darren is representing the other party, if Darren notifies me of something and I don't notify Mr. Eugene, is Mr. Eugene still classified as having notice? Yes. Yes. If I, if Darren tells me my client accepts your client's offer and I forget to tell Mr. Eugene, guess what? Mr. Eugene is technically notified, and therefore, that's it. But that doesn't make no sense. Why? Well, I guess they can you know, like they did their duty to let that agent know. Um, well, yes. So when you have an agent, it's just like a lawyer. Yeah. If you're in a criminal case and you hire an attorney, I hire Miss Davenport, attorney Davenport here. The state is not going to call Justin Nobles. The state's going to call Attorney Davenport. And Attorney Davenport must let me know. Okay? But if Attorney Davenport puts it on her paralegal's desk, Mr. Grossman, and Mr. Grossman is supposed to notify me, and he just goes, files it away, and just puts it away, I am still classified as being 
noticed. So how does that other agent ever get notified if you forgot? Not the agent, the seller. I mean the seller. It, you'll find out after there's a lawsuit. You'll find out one way or another. Yes. Yes. Give me just a minute, folks, for just a second. Okay. So, coming back to what we're saying is, yes, Ms. Linda, I know you're talking about that. How exactly do they know? Well, number one, either they're going to get sued, but most of the time it doesn't go to that extent that quick. What's going to happen is, if Darren told me my client accepts the offer, okay, that's, that's fine. But if Darren doesn't ever see the paperwork, what's Darren going to do? He's going to call me back and do what? Hey, where's that paperwork? We accepted it, Justin. And I'm going to be like, oh, crap, I forgot about that. Let me get that. Okay. So, again, you need to be aware of that, that you have to stay on top of it. Now, I want to say one more thing, Miss Linda, because I know where you're going with this. Is the broker liable? Let's, let's change this up a little bit. Say, for example, that uh, Mr. Jacob is an agent, and he's representing Mr. Ms. Sheldon. And Mr. Jacob works for me. Okay? So Mr. Jacob is my agent, and he is representing Sheldon. And Mr. Grossman calls Mr. Jacob and says, we accept your offer. Okay? Is the broker truly liable if Mr. Jacob forgets? Yes, I am. I am liable. But did Mr. Jacob follow the protocol of the brokerage? If the broker requires that he's supposed to notify the broker within three days, he did not. So who's at fault? Mr. Jacob would be. So in that situation is while Sheldon would sue me directly, what am I going to do? Turn around and sue Mr. Jacob because he failed to do what? He failed to notify his broker like his contract agreement states. You see how this works. Okay. So there is still, don't just immediately consume that. Oh my God, the broker. There is times you as an agent can be sued. That's why it is important that you have to make certain you stay on top of stuff. Okay? There's what's called inputted knowledge. So if the client knows, the client knows if the agent knows. So if I'm in an inspection and my buyer is not with me, Say in this particular situation that Mr. Smith, he ends up in this particular situation. He is supposed to be in the company in the meeting with us. Trying to see real quick. Yep, there he is. Mr. Smith, he hears me now. Mr. Smith here, he's in the meeting with us right now. And we go, Mr. Smith can't come to the inspection, Mr. Eugene. You're the inspector. Okay? And so I go out, Mr. Smith had to go do some work. I come out to the inspection and I'm watching everything and you're like, oh man, the roof's bad, the structure's bad, the foundation's bad. And I'm like, man, I better not tell Mr. Smith this. When I tell him that, then he's gonna end up doing what? He's gonna back out. So I'm only gonna tell him, Mr. Eugene, I only want you to tell him just the roof is bad. Don't say anything else or he'll back out. Okay. What's the problem here? Why? You're lying. You have to put everything down. And if you told me, what does that mean? I am now what? The client knows if I know. So you can't be concealing things from your client. Okay. 
What about the professional and ethical responsibilities? We talked about owed car in a previous class. And remember that the client is owed those fiduciary duties. You have to obey them. You have to also in the same situation, you have to have accounting. You have to, and also the same situation, you have to ensure that as you're going through these situations that you are responsible, that you're following the duties, you're doing everything that you're supposed to do, okay? Remember that all parties are entitled to what? Good faith, fairness, and honesty. And that's all parties. And the accurate information and material facts. I can't hide certain things from my client, nor customer. I have to disclose them. That's one thing actually, by the way, that clients will ask you a lot. Ms. Davenport, you just got your license and I'm selling my house. So, and this will happen to you, I promise you, Ms. Davenport, and everybody else that's listening, this will happen to you. Ms. Davenport comes out to my house, she walks in, she looks at it, and she's like, oh my God, what in the world's happened in this house? But she don't say that to me, okay? She's just thinking that. And I walk in and I sit down, I said, how you been doing, Miss Davenport? You doing good, girl? I hear you got your license. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you, Miss Davenport. So I got some questions for you. I've been, I want to sell my house here. You see, I mean, the, the roof, you know, we had a we had a leak up there in 1980. We haven't fixed that yet. We we have some foundation issues over there. Yeah, I've been waiting on the hammer and the nail to fix that. Uh, and then we went over and uh, we had got some other issues around here, but I was thinking a good fresh paint of coat. And we just say this house is in good condition. What you think, Miss Davenport? Why, why are you saying no? But, but, Miss they, they don't need to know all that stuff. They, they do? But Mr. Eugene told me he would come out and list my house, and he said a good fresh coat, paint a coat would be wonderful on you. What, what does she do, Cody, in that situation? Should she still take my listing if I'm already being that way? I mean, if Mr. Eugene said he could, I'm going to go with him, but I can't do that. That's right. If Mr. Eugene said he'd do that, you go right ahead. You go right ahead and you do that. They know me, yeah, you just use you just and here's why. You know why? You let you let me go with Mr. Eugene. Because here's what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen, Mr. Eugene? Once we do that fresh coat of paint and everything and you list the property and say there's no problems, what's gonna happen? When Stefan buys the property, what's gonna happen? What's he gonna find out? He's gonna find all the problems. He's gonna find all the problems out. We tried to hide. Stephanie, are you, are you just going to go over there and just be like, oh, there's a hundred thousand dollars in damage. I'll just pay it. Is that how this works? No, what are you going to do? I'm going to jump back out or do something else. Well, if you've already bought it, what are you going to do? you got to sue, don't you? Oh, sue him. He's going to sue me and he's going to sue Mr. Eugene. <clears throat> Let me like a breach of the seller's disclosure. Exactly. He did not disclose. Mr. Eugene also in the same situation, he's being deceitful. So in these different situations, what ends up happening? We're having problems. Do not ever, ever be concerned about these particular situations, okay? just a bit. All right, so again, like I said, these are just your basic duties here that you have to end up giving out. Now, when you're terminating an agency, okay, these are some of the key things here that you have to look at. So number one, of course, in the contract itself, there's a timeline, the duty, okay, a time frame. So Miss Linda, if you end up, if you sign a contract with Miss Davenport, what ends up happening? Mr. Davenport, you're going to give a certain time frame. So if time lapses, are you still obligated to Ms. Davenport? Yes. 
or is Miss Davenport still obligated to you if the time has already lapsed? So y'all's y'all's duty ended, Miss Linda, on February eighth. That's when your contract ended. Does she still represent you? No. Do you still have a duty to her, or does she have a duty to you? No. No. So in that situation, is that contract terminated? Yeah. Yeah. So time's lapsed. Okay. The next one is the actions of the principals and the agents. Okay. Mr. Eugene, can, if you as an agent represent Mr. Grossman, if you're not fulfilling your duties and doing what you said in the contract, could that technically your failure to do your duties allow Stephan to get out of the contract? Yeah. And vice versa. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because the actions themselves, if you're not fulfilling your job, one of the key ones that most agents make a mistake on is when they're filling out a contract, see this all the time. Not only just in my office, but every office. New agents do this. They go in and they say, hey, Miss Linda, I'm a new agent. Can you give me a copy of Mr. Eugene's uh, listing or one of his contracts? Because I want to use it as a template. No. Nope. Well, some brokers will. They'll give it to them. Nope. And then what happens? Nope. They're going to come over here and they're going to sit down. And they're going to do what? Verbatim type what Mr. Eugene said. Verbatim. They don't know what they typed. They just typed. And then they go get them to sign it. And they don't even know what's, what's the stuff. They don't even notice in that listing contract that you have to have a sign up, a lockbox up, and it on the MLS in seven pictures within 72 hours. They don't know that. They just kind of, well, I follow what the template says. That's right. My mind that drives me personally crazy as a real estate broker is this, personally. I say, and I'm not, I'm just picking on Stefan, but I'm just saying this. I'll say, Stefan, what's the option period lapsed? I don't know. When's the, uh, Wait, wait, how much did we put down for earnest money? Oh, I don't know. Um, when did we end up, uh, what did we do with, um, what else is there? What's the, what is the, uh, the closing date? I don't know. What's the problem with that? You should know all those questions. Oh, he's a real estate agent. He needs to know them. You should know those answers just like that. You need to be able to spit those out because it's your client. And most of the time, what's the deal? They're going to say what, Miss Linda? What do they say most of the time? Well, i got so many clients. Is that an excuse? No. Or I'm busy. That's another one, Mr. Eugene. So, Mr. Cody, you're a, you're a judge now. Oh, boy. And, and so, Mr. Grossman's being sued by Ms. Davenport for failing to do his duty. And... Uh, he comes to you and you say, well, Mr. Grossman, what's your, uh, what's your defense? I don't know. I was busy. How's that going to hold up for you? Not at all. Judge is going to say, not my problem. I'm busy. My, my, my docket's a year and a half backlog. And you say you're busy and you have one client. Not, ex not acceptable. Period. Okay. You have a duty you have an obligation and a responsibility to what? To know your transactions. Inside, upside, down, and around, everything else. You've got to know them. Okay? The operation of law. Sometimes the laws change. There can be something like this. Mr. Eugene, you, are, uh, you go in and you sign a contract to list Enrique's property in Houston. So you list it. And Enrique goes over here and he's listed property and he's selling it residential. And then the city of Houston goes in and rezones that whole area and it's only allowed to be agricultural. Is your contract valid anymore? No. No, because what, you, what does your contract say? You can do what? Sell it as a residence. And now the city just said what? It's agricultural. That's agricultural. I can't do it. So your whole contract's void. Okay? 
So in that situation right now, Bryan College Station is having a huge, not Bryan College Station, but College Station is having a huge situation. Because what's ending up happening in this situation is that you have in these particular elements, what we're seeing is, is that they don't, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of investors are moving in here or they're buying up property for College Station, not Bryan, but College Station mainly. So what ends up happening is, is they go through here and College Station is now a city council is trying to make it where properties cannot have no more than two unrelated parties, two unrelated parties. So if Ms. Davenport, Mr. Eugene is an investor and she's coming in to buy a property of yours. Okay. Because the whole purpose is Ms. Davenport wants to end up, she wants to rent the property out to college students. Well, she wants to make profits. So she wants to rent yours to five bedroom and she wants to rent out to five college kids. So she makes money. Okay. Well, what's actually going on right now is the city of college station says if it passes, no more than two unrelated people can buy or can live in a house. Exactly. Exactly. So in this particular situation is Ms. Davenport, if you can't rent the property out to five people and you can only rent it out to two, do you now still want to buy his property? Heck no, it's not worth her time. I can only rent it out to two people. What's the point? There's no point. There's no reason. So in that particular situation is now that self fell through. But there are in these situations, there can be the operation of law. Okay. There can be these different types of situations. Also, in regards to time, TRAILA does require a termination date. And that termination date has to be expressed. Let's say that again. Trailer requires that there has to be a termination date. You cannot put indefinitely. Okay, there has to be an express deadline. And look at the second one. Mr. Grossman can't go in and be like, ha ha ha, I'm going to outsmart the system. I'll put that it ends in uh, 1231 of this year, but then I'm going to put special provisions that renews automatically every year. <laughs> I'm the smart system. So every time Mr. Eugene buys a house, I get paid. Guess what, Mr. Grossman? I'm sorry, but it cannot automatically renew. You can't do that. You have to actually contact Mr. Eugene every year and have him sign a new one. Okay. Also, the reasonable time period includes this, meaning that in regards to the reasonable time period, that it has to be within a reasonable time. Most courts don't like to classify. Some of them won't say anything over a year. Some of them won't do no more than two because reasonable means what? Within a normal realistic time frame. Should it take you as a real estate agent five years to find Mr. Eugene a house? Hey, no. It takes you five years to find Mr. Eugene a house? There's a problem. Unless the client is very, very picky. Unless, unless Mr. Eugene's picky. That's true. If that house yep. isn't squared or something. Yep. But do you want to be stuck, Mr. Stephan, do you want to be stuck to Mr. Eugene if he's a picky, picky client for five years? No. Heck no. That's what I go to the broker and ask the broker. You know, I can't, of this, right? I can't satisfy this client. Do you have somebody else in the office? That exactly. Okay. <laughs> What about the actions of the principal? Again, there are accomplishments of agency objective. Okay. There are certain things that the, the principal, now remember we're talking about the client here, the accomplishment of the agency objective. Mr. Eugene, what's the accomplishment? What's the agency objective? If you're signing a listing contract with Mr. Grossman, what's the objective? What's he trying to do, Ms. Linda? Trying to make a sale. Trying to sell his house. So Mr. Eugene, you have to help Stefan sell your house by meaning that if Stefan puts the property and he's following everything to the T's and he's getting consistent people wanting to show and you keep saying, oh, I don't want to show today. I don't feel like showing. I don't want to show. What's the problem? You're not being, you're not fulfilling the objection. Okay. I've had a client like that before. We did everything to the T 
put sign up, I get listings or calls to go show the house. No, I don't I don't like I don't like people in my house. Then why are you selling your house? Well, I don't want them in my house. Well, what do you expect? Well, they can look at pictures. Yeah. How how Mr. Grossman, you're you're a licensed agent. How accurate are some of these pictures you see online, sir? Uh, Photoshop is a thing. Yeah, Photoshop's a thing. Okay. Also, they need to be aware of the expiration of the agency agreement. If the parties cannot agree, they can mutually do what, Miss Linda? Split ways. The principal can revoke the contract. But the revocation, you got to be careful with. If I go show in, uh, Sheldon some properties and I find her prime property for her, and then she decides, hmm, I'm going to kick Justin to the corner so I can save some money. Uh, yes, she might can revoke the contract, but guess what happens? She still has to do what? She's still got to pay me. Okay. There can also be renunciation of the uh, the agent. Same thing. The agent can just bag out. Sometimes the agent can just abandon it. Sometimes the agent can just be like, this client has lost their mind. I'm out of here. Deuces. Okay? And I don't care what Mr. Uh, what Mr. Eugene or Mr. Justin or Miss Linda or anybody, I don't care what they say. I'm out of here. Deuces. Okay? Yeah. And sometimes there can be breach of fiduciary duty. Okay. Sometimes there can be a breach of fiduciary duty. Now, also the law. These are the legal ways that you can get out of the contract. If either the agent or the principal dies, they're done. If either the agent or the principal dies, it's done. This is the next one. If the agent becomes incapacitated, if an agent ends up, that's why you gotta be very careful in these situations, if the agent becomes incapacitated, guess what happens? All contracts are no null and void. If there is a law that comes into a place that overrules another law, it takes rule. If either the broker, which is the agent, or the client files bankruptcy, condemnation occurs of the property, or the property is destroyed, those are other ways that it can be removed. Okay. Now, duties of the agents, agency that still survive. So these are things that after it's all said and done, these are the things that are afterwards. Okay. What exactly is done? So in this particular situation is confidentiality will continue forever. Okay. Confidentiality continues forever. All right. And they may disclose only with consent. So Mr. Eugene, confidentiality in this situation, it does continue forever. So if you end up, when we're talking about this, you find out some confidential information, you cannot disclose it after the contract's done. It continues forever. Now, if, say, Mr. Grossman's your client and he gives you consent, then you can. But it has to be in writing. So what are our key points this evening? Okay, what exactly is our key points? Well, Payment of fee does not necessarily create an agency. Just because I pay you does not mean that we have an agency. Okay. When creating an agency, they can either be expressed, implied, estoppel, or ratified. Okay. And they can be with or without writing, but it's always recommended what? in writing. Now, a broker, of course, is a fiduciary regardless of how the agency is created. 
So a licensee can be an agent and not even know it. If the consumer thinks they are represented, guess what? The courts are going to hold that you're liable. So if that client thinks, Cody, that you're representing them, guess what? You're held liable. So that's why it's very important when you go out to showings and you're saying that you're shadowing an agent, what should you tell somebody if they ask, or not even ask, what should you tell somebody when you first meet them? That you're what? I'm an intern or I'm, I'm his assistant, but I'm not a what? Not a licensed real estate agent. I'm studying to become one, but I'm not an agent. Any questions need to be heard? That's correct. So in that situation is, should actually Mr. If, if say, for example, Cody is following or shadowing Mr. Stephan, and he comes, they both meet you, Miss Linda, at a property to look at it, can Stephan, or should Cody be the one that tells you he's not an agent? Or how should it work? Usually the agent, Stephan, would introduce himself and Cody and in the introduction, Stefan will tell the people that Cody is his assistant, that any questions should be referred to me. That is correct. Basically, if there's children, Cody watches the children while the family looks around the house, etc. That's correct. The agent, whoever the agent is, should always walk up and say, Hello, Miss Nobles, how are you doing today? I hope you're doing well this, uh, this day. Uh, this, by the way, is my assistant, Mr. Grossman. He's studying to get his real estate license. So he's just going to be shadowing us today. And that's it. You don't have to do that every time. Like if no, not every time. Times. Not every time. Just when you first introduce yourself yeah. to that client. That's right. You don't have to. If I'm going to Miss Linda and show her five different times properties, I don't have to say the same thing. I just need to tell her in the initial meeting that Mr. Grossman is my assistant, he's studying, he'll be shadowing us. Okay, and that's all you have to do. Again, agency can be terminated either through mutual agreement, unilaterally, meaning one party, expiration of time, the agent abandons it, or operation of law. Okay. Again, you have to know the difference. Remember, a customer, a customer is due accurate information and material facts, while the client gets the opinion and advice as well as the information. Okay. Suggestions for the broker. You need to develop a company program that are clearly stating the office services. The company should also have an office policy in regards to the report of variations immediately. And our, our discussion for tonight, I'm actually going to do something a little bit differently tonight than what I normally do. I am going to let Mr. Grossman what? take <laughs> the, listen, I'm going to let Mr. Grossman tonight we, I picked it up on y'all here in the classroom. I'm going to let Mr. Grossman Answer read the, the question, He's and saying. then he will pick on somebody that is online, and we'll go from there. I'm not online only right now. If we have questions left over, we'll pick on those again in the classroom. So, Mr. Grossman, you will read. Mr. Grossman, you will read the question, sir, and then pick a person to answer, please, sir. Uh, question one. You guys talk very high because the microphone's up there. Uh, why doesn't the fact the seller pays the broker a commission necessarily make the broker the agent of the seller? Or let's do uh miss leela she has a migraine give her a break tonight okay not miss leela never mind uh, it's too well I, I can i'll try uh because i was looking at it is is it is it because it's not you don't have anything in writing is that wrong 
Let's see. Why doesn't the fact that the seller pays the broker a commission necessarily make the broker the agent of the seller? So in this situation, the key that they're asking here is they're talking about a commission. Uh, so let me see here. Remember, this was that one that we talked about. It's not an essential element. So it really, the reason in that situation is the fact that the seller pays the broker a commission does not have to be required because the fact of the matter is, is it's not a necessary element of the contract because you don't have to pay somebody to represent them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that good for everybody in here? You understand where it's going with that? Okay, go ahead. Uh, how does the concept of constructive imputed notice affect negotiating in a contract? Uh, Garrett, what's up? Um, Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody want to help Garrett? Is it because the um I would say um whatever me as the agent knows, my client has to know as well. Uh, I can't conceal anything. Yeah, like you know, like you let the other agent know. That they accept your offer or counter decline it, counter offer, what have you. Like they're under the impression that the client knows you are both exactly on right here. You're both exactly right. Keith, you're you're exactly correct. Cody, you're exactly correct. Remember, you're you're negotiating just like this morning. I had an agent text me and they sent me something. Okay. My client is now deemed to know that because it's been texted to me. So you are exactly correct. The notice, the concept of construction, constructive notice is going to affect the negotiating of a contract through the discussions and expressions that are made between the parties okay, and their agents. So very good on that one. Proceed. What actions or conduct performed by a salesperson would lead a court to decide that the salesperson and his or her broker are the implied agents of the buyer? Um, Enrique. He's like, thanks. Blame Justin, not me. <laughs> Um, for breaking the rules. <laughs> what rules? Um, for doing illegal things. <laughs> he, he's, he's, what's that called? That pedal in here? He's trying. He's trying to, he's trying to keep himself. Here, here, let me help you out here, Ray All right. What is it? In, what is it? Through the so it, an implied agency is created through what? What did we talk about? Action. Create it through words, or is it created through eight, or through your actions? Through actions. Through your actions. Okay. Well, let's come back up here. What action? Putting... You're right. You're right. Stay with it. What actions or conduct performed by a salesperson would lead a court to decide? that you are an agent to the buyer. Let me help you with one. I'm gonna give, uh, you, I'm gonna give you one and I want you to come up with another one, okay? Could me showing homes to you without a, a contract, would you assume that I might be your agent? Yes. Okay, what's another or one? If, or, 
if you're calling to get information on my home that I have listed, I'm assuming that if you were to put a contract in that I am the, I would be your representing, I'd be representing them. On track, you're on track. Anything that a lot, through your actions, things like what you said, create basically an implied agency through your actions. So by calling on a listing, showing a listing, going over writing a contract on a listing, those are things that can create an implied contract or agency. Okay? Very good on that one, Henry Gate. Next one. What are some of the distinctions? What are some of the distinctions between the duties owed to a client and those that are owed to a customer? Uh, Colton, you here? Okay. Okay. Um, I would say um, with the client, you're gonna owe them your fidu fiduciary duties. Um, with the customer, you could give them like information, accurate information. Exactly. With a client, you can give them more your opinions, your advice, all of that information, stuff like that. With a customer, I can only give you basically material facts and the basic information. You get less information because you're a customer. Excellent job, Keith. Next one. How do the fiduciary duties apply to an agent when selling a house to a close relative of, a, of the agent who is not collecting a fee? Uh, Ms. Shelton. Um, you can't do that, right? Um, like you have to go by the law and continue to act out on the same actions that you would do to a regular client than you would a relative. You can't um, switch up. Exactly. Sorry, that's probably not the greatest technical term. <laughs> so, you're on, you're on track there, girl. You're on track. Unfair treatment. You got to end the situation, like Cody said, there cannot be unfair treatment. It's got to be treated everybody the same. You cannot in the situation. You have to treat the entire transaction the same. The whole part down here, this whole not collecting a fee, what did we just say earlier? Courts don't give a crap about that. If you make a bad business decision, the court don't care. The court doesn't care. You made a bad decision. That's not their problem. Everybody across the board has to be treated fairly. Okay. All right, Mr. Grossman, this is that's our last slide for this evening. So we're going to go ahead and stop recording, Mr. Grossman. I like to say that my question was hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, these, these are